We're going to go ahead and get started. If you could please find a table, that would be wonderful. Glad to see people are milling around and networking. But we have some really interesting things to talk about today, so I do want to start in a timely manner so that we have plenty of time for our keynote speaker and for all of you to ask questions. So I'd like to welcome you to our 2011 symposium on research, scholarship, and creative activity. It's called Scholars in Action. President Allen was thrilled when he learned of our selected keynote speaker for our symposium today, as he himself played an instrumental role at that other university down the road, which shall go unnamed, in the broadening definition of scholarship. He was disappointed he could not be with us today, and we wish him well, certainly in his continued recovery. He did say to extend a hello to all of you. Pro uh, Provost Gibson will be joining us later today, just as soon as she is able, since she is currently playing both provost and president. Her schedule uh, this morning was called away for a Board of Regents call. Now, when our symposium planning team discussed who to invite to serve as our keynote speaker, some consistent phrases came up in our discussion. Scholarship has evolved. Faculty workload balance is difficult. And we want to build from the momentum of our previous symposium in 2009 by President Michael Crow. Considering these conversations, we landed at today's invited speaker, Dr. Jean Rice. He's the author of Making the Case for the New American Scholar and co-author of Faculty Priorities Reconsidered rewarding multiple forms of scholarship. We had a very stimulating reading group yesterday where um, we had about 30 of us across campus who did a shared reading of um, chapters one and 15 from that last book, Faculty Priorities Reconsidered. He will be the first to tell you that we are not alone in the questions we are asking ourselves and the challenges that we face in balancing our commitment to student learning, scholarship, and service, or as I often like to refer to it, engagement. Evidence exists in just the second paragraph of the preface of Ernest Boyer's seminal work in 1990, Scholarship Reconsidered Priorities of the Professoriate. And please bear in mind, that was more than 20 years ago. Ernest Boyer stated, at the very heart of the current debate, the single concern around which all others pivot is the issue of faculty time. Boyer also noted that the comprehensive university, perhaps more than any other, can benefit most from a redefinition of scholarship. Many of these institutions offering a broad range of baccalaureate and master's programs are having a difficult time sorting out priorities. That probably sounds familiar. Boyer did not call for our institutions to direct what type of scholarship our faculty would conduct, but rather that our institutions expand the options for our faculty, allowing for creativity and diversity in their work and the opportunity to pursue their talents and their strengths and their passion. If you consider the private sector for a moment, and I promise it will only be a short moment, the most innovative organizations are those that have realized that their people, their human capital, are their greatest asset. Many of these companies have moved to adopt employee engagement models as a strategy to retain their greatest asset. Employee engagement was described in the academic literature by Harder, Schmidt, and Hayes as the individual's involvement and satisfaction with, as well as enthusiasm for, their work. What drives satisfaction? It's not rocket science. 
It's the opportunity to apply your talents and career development opportunities are top drivers of job satisfaction. Effective organizations fit the talents of their people to the needs of the organization. They also recognize that changing patterns of personal and professional growth occur across a lifetime, that people will evolve in their desires to pursue different interests. Our keynote speaker today will also speak to the utilization of all of our employees' talents in, a, in our work at the university in a networked and collaborative fashion. Again, the valuing of diversity, not uniformity, is the key. We know the term scholarship was once easy to define, but that is no longer the case. What constitutes scholarship has undergone a major transformation in the past 20 years since that seminal work of Ernest Boyer. It's created considerable confusion as to what it is, how it is done, and how it is evaluated. Our own accrediting agency has expanded the idea of faculty scholarship to include a much wider view of acquiring, creating, and applying knowledge. Today is an opportunity for us to learn more about how a scholarship has evolved and its role in academic excellence. We do not need to begin from scratch, but rather can build upon our history, both in terms of the evolution of our institution and the work that has already been done at UNI in the past decade. Let me speak first to the evolution of our institution. It's not surprising that we have a strong applied orientation at UNI. After all, our roots are in the normal school and the teacher's college. From their beginnings, B.B. Henderson, in his article, Teaching at the People's University, pointed out that normal schools were community-oriented. Many of the normal schools, UNI included, were not four-year colleges until they became teacher's colleges as we did in 1934. The teacher's college did not last long, however. Once we became a four-year degree-granting college, our move from a single-purpose institution to a university offering a comprehensive array of undergraduate programs was a logical one. By 1960, Henderson found the term teacher's college no longer existed in most states, ours included. As the lower and middle class baby boomers, boomers began to expect access to higher education in the 1960s and 70s, it was these state comprehensive colleges that provided access to them, particularly females, and became what E.A. Dunham referred to in 1969 as the colleges of the forgotten Americans. Now, let me speak to the past decade. In many ways, our scholarship today is reflective of our long-held commitment to the forgotten Americans. Much of our scholarship makes certain all individuals have access to opportunities previously denied them. Whether it's designing and implementing a rural entrepreneurship delivery system or providing children with low incidence, severe disabilities, the opportunity to experience literacy for the first time. We provide children and adults with experience in, experiences in arts and culture that encourage them, as well as us, to not only find common ground, but reach collectively for higher ground. Earlier in the decade, you and I was one of four universities selected nationally as part of a pilot by ASCU, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, through a Kellogg Foundation initiative called Stewards of Place. We were one of four selected nationally. We were selected for this distinctive honor because of our existing commitment to the idea that place matters. We had long been an institution deeply engaged in our community in multiple ways. And there are multiple ways community can be defined, right? We know that some of us consider community our local, others a little bit more regional, some state, some nationally, 
some global, but there are multiple ways community can be defined. We worked collectively with our local community partners over a period of 18 months in an initiative we referred to as Making Place Matter. The idea was to enhance the depth and breadth of our engagement here at UNI. We were doing well, but we didn't want to stop there. We're now in our seventh year of celebrating that engagement through the Viridian Credit Union Community Engagement Awards, where our faculty, many of whom are with us today, have integrated two or even sometimes all three of the legs of the three-legged stool to enhance student learning and conduct scholarship in ways that simultaneously provide benefit to our community. A committee on faculty scholarship and service acknowledged the multiple forms of scholarship in 2008. In 2009, Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University, inspired us in this same room to be more intentional about how we value interdisciplinary scholarship at our previous symposium. And we have made tremendous strides since then in advancing interdisciplinary through the commitment of our provost, our new strategic plan, and through so many of you in the room with us today. We are at a critical juncture of both problems and promise. Some of these problems include the current difficulties in the economy, the privatization, the privatization of education, the morale of our people, and a declining population of young Iowans. The struggle to define what it means to be a scholar at UNI affects hiring, rewards, the daily work of faculty, and morale. The solutions to our problems are not in the imitation of either the research university or the selective liberal arts colleges, but rather the solution lies within the promise of who we already are. The public wants universities to put more emphasis on teaching. We already place students first. There are ways, however, we can build upon that. The public wants universities to be more engaged in their economic and cultural development. We are already stewards of place. There are ways, however, we can build upon that. This may, in fact, just be our time to do both. According to Brewer, Gates, and Goldman, there are three major generators of institutional status and prestige. And we know that some of what we're, universities are experiencing nationally in these questions about expanding definitions of scholarship get caught up in those concerns about status and prestige. There's student selectivity, high level research through grants and publications, and big time athletics, football and men's basketball. If we choose to evaluate ourselves against these measures, we will seldom fare well, except in those years that we bust the nation's brackets. However, if we embrace our differences, the strengths that we have to offer instead, in our commitment to our students and in our place, we could have what our keynote speaker is off is here to offer us today, a new view of academic excellence, that the University of Northern Iowa can, be, can play a key role in defining for ourselves, our future, and let's not forget the forgotten Americans. So we have with us today, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jean Rice. He has a brief, biographical sketch, which runs a full page. I'd hate to see <laughs> the lengthy biographical sketch, and, but for good reason that his brief biographical sketch is so long, because spending time with his, him yesterday in our reading group and dinner last night was such an incredible treat. He has done so many things that I would like to just share quickly with you. 
He's currently a senior scholar at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. He holds an appointment in the PhD program in leadership and change for senior professionals at Antioch University. For 10 years, he served as the director of the Forum on Faculty Roles and Rewards and the New Pathways Projects at the American Association for Higher Education. Before moving to AAHE, he was vice president and dean of the faculty at Antioch College, where he held an appointment of professor of sociology and religion. Earlier, Jean was program executive and senior fellow at the Carnegie Foundation engaged in the national study of scholarly priorities. Ernest Boyer is no longer with us on this earth, but we have the next best thing and possibly, quite possibly the best thing because Ernest Boyer wrote the report, uh, he, his name was on the report, but it was really Jean Rice who was behind those definitions of scholarship. His work on scholarship reconsidered and uh, the work in the new, uh, new Pathways Working Paper series resulted in making a place for the New American Scholar and the book I mentioned earlier, Faculty Priorities Reconsidered. Currently, he's working on faculty initiatives that have potential for improving conditions in developing countries torn by violent civil conflict. He's been in the West Bank, working with Palestinian universities and in West Africa's Liberia, assisting in the initiation of national professional development programs. We know recently he was in Malta as well, and we were quite envious of that. Rice's recent work on early career faculty can be found in a paper entitled Heeding New Voices, American Academic Careers for a New Generation. He also collaborated with Mary Sorsonelli in a chapter on improving the tenure process, appearing in a book on tenure published recently by Harvard Press. During the major part of his career, when he was president or professor of sociology and religion at the University of the Pacific, he helped initiate the first of the experimental cluster colleges, Raymond College, and served as chairperson of the Department of Sociology. His teaching and research focus on the sociology and ethics of the professions and the workplace. He served on a number of national boards. Found out last night he was on the first board for POD, the Professional Organization Development Network. He served also with the Society for Values in Higher Education and the Accounting Education Change Commission. He's currently a member of the National Advisory Board of the Center for, Integrated, or for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning, which was established by NSF at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Among the awards he's received are the Danforth Fellowship, National Endowment of the Humanities Research Fellowship. The um, 2009, he received the Distinguished Achievement Award from Point Loma Nazarene University. And he is a graduate of Harvard Divinity School and received his PhD from Harvard University. My favorite line in his bio is really the last, which is that in Change Magazine's survey of leadership, in American higher education, Gene Rice is recognized as one of a small group of idea leaders whose work has made a difference nationally and globally. Here to share his ideas with us today is Gene Rice. My life passed before me as <laughs> she was going through that uh, biography. I thank you for doing that. I kind of apologize for the length of it, but it goes with a long life, so um, it's better than the alternative. But thanks, <laughs> thanks, Christy. 
I'm delighted to be here. Really enjoyed yesterday at our meeting, and there were a number of you here who were in that session. I feel like I know some of you, and I certainly know more about the university, and Christy, thank you for the kind of, I keep pushing her for the history of the place, and uh, thank you for, for going through that. For years now, I've been exploring uh, the changing faculty role. I've interviewed faculty. I've surveyed faculty. I've written about faculty. I directed this forum on faculty roles and rewards for 10 years. But most important, I've been a faculty member. If I were a, an anthropologist, faculty would be my tribe. Faculty would be my people. I can't pass through a town when I'm on vacation without visiting the local campus. I actually think it's an obsession. So I'm, uh, I'm here to, to share with you my, my addiction. Um, in this session this morning, I want us to uh, talk about the models of academic excellence. What makes for good work? What is it that gets rewarded? And um, I'm convinced that if we really take a careful look at American higher education, there are only two models that dominate our thinking about academic excellence and the changing character of faculty work. There it is. This is a kind of outline of, uh, of what I want to do. Um, I want to go through those two models. Um, but there was also a period of radical transition, and I think we're in the middle of that. And it started in the 80s, and uh, a lot of people have talked about it as transformation. But now books are beginning to appear to talk about the crisis in American higher education. They're proliferating. Our news, uh, the newspapers, the news shows are filled with it. There's a Columbia professor, Mark uh, Taylor, who has written an essay that uh, really built, who has written an essay in, that appeared in the New York Times entitled, The End of the American University as We Know It. And he now has put that in book form, and it's out entitled, The Crisis on Campus. Taylor's, Taylor and others are predicting that American higher education will be the next big bubble. Now that's scary, given what we've just gone through. Uh, but he really is saying we can't continue to do business as usual. What we're doing is no longer sustainable. What I want to do is to examine with you the nature of the transition taking place and whether, and I raise this as a question, whether we are moving toward a third way, a third way of viewing academic excellence. And I think a number of the things that you're doing here um, is really leading the way. And uh, to make this part of your identity and to provide a kind of national presence where uh, this transition is played out and you do it in a public way and you make it a part of your scholarship, I think uh, is a real challenge. But the first model that we all know about, the first model of academic excellence, uh, it's been with us a long time and is rooted back in Athens and Oxford and Cambridge and the early days of, of uh, Harvard and Yale and Oberlin and Carleton, Grinnell. Um, it is the vision that fundamentally shaped, uh, without being fully realized, uh, what happened in the emergence of those small colleges that appeared on the frontier uh, as the nation moved west during the 19th century. It's the model of the liberal arts college. It's a vision of the faculty member as a teacher scholar, as the complete scholar, uh, the complete scholar uh, with responsibility for educating, as it was put then, the whole person. And in fact, the president would usually teach the last course, and it would be a course on moral philosophy. 
moral education. So that whole notion of taking the student seriously was at the heart of this. It is this model that is especially appealing to me and uh, really has a warm place in my heart, as I think you'll see. The second model, the one that uh, most dominates our thinking about academic excellence and has become normative for most of us because most of us went to graduate school and received our PhDs from the universities that are driven by this model, the research university, where the professor is the specialist, the specialist on the cutting edge of his or her field. This is the model that was imported from Germany at the beginning of the 20th century and became the basis for what was called the new American university. Despite the extraordinary diversity of American higher education, and actually it is the diversity that is the hallmark of, a, of American higher education. When you go to China or you go to India and you talk to faculty there, uh, they come back to us with that. It's that, um, it's the diversity. It's that capacity for creativity and, uh, and fostering the new that they really admire. But actually, they can do the widgets faster than we can. Uh, they have certainly more, a larger population. So they do the instrumental work, but they have looked to America for the creativity, uh, for those, those breakthroughs. But most especially in higher education, for the diversity that we've managed to institutionalize. It is this model that dominates our thinking about faculty work and what we think about scholarly excellence. When the American university is referred to, as it has been in the past at least, as the envy of the world, um, this was what was being referred to. We're now hearing that, uh, in fact, there's uh, a new book now out ac um, academically adrift that uh, we probably all want to look at, but uh, it's arguing that we're living off a reputation that's established by a very few elite universities and uh, the rest of us are, are following along. This morning I want to sketch out those two models uh, more fully and, uh, and note as I do with both of them, that I find them very attractive, but I'm also convinced that neither is economically sustainable given the way in which they've evolved. And then I want to talk about this transition period, the one we've been going through in recent years and the major changes that are taking place in the way we teach, the way we learn, the way we conduct our inquiries and organize our work. And then I'll talk briefly about a, a third way. Um, and it has these characteristics, and I'll just, uh, to kind of give you a full introduction, this is where I'm going. It's one that is more integrative, more collaborative, more inclusive, more engaged, and networked. Okay, let's talk about the teacher-scholar. Really was developed in the liberal arts college. Bruce Kimball has written a remarkable book entitled Orators and Philosophers, A History of the Idea of, Modern educa of Liberal Education. He finds two traditions in the history of um, liberal education. Uh, one, the focus on the student and their development. Well, I guess both of them do, but the first comes from the philosophers hold that the pursuit of knowledge is the highest good. And this is represented by, uh, by Socrates and, and Plato. And then there's the second focus, which uh, sees the college or the university as developing character and building community through the cultivation of leadership. And this is the tradition of the orator and the rhetorician uh, Cicero, he chooses as the representative of that model. But two of these visions, one, um, scholarship as, uh, as focusing on um, 
learning knowledge, the subject matter, and then the development of the student and the relationship uh, to learning and the building of community. So here we have a vision, a vision of quality that uh, informs the teacher-scholar. What I've called the, the complete scholar in older writings of mine, responsibility for student learning, for the institution as a whole, and then the development of uh, community leadership for a burgeoning democracy. And it's interesting, democracy has always been a part of the discussion of American higher education. Um, Thomas Jefferson pushed it very hard. There was a direct connection between education and democracy. I was just at a conference at the Department of Education on Monday, and, uh, and we were talking about civic engagement. And nothing was said about the global world. And yet our, our newspapers and our TV shows have been filled with what's going on uh, in the streets of Egypt. And the key term is democracy. And what's meant by that? We need to get back to that, that central mission. And uh, it was important in those colleges. And John Dewey, I think, has really, John Dewey's being resurrected now. And uh, uh, it seems to me he really articulated that vision of the, the connection between education and democracy. He's one of the founders of AAUP, American Association of University Professors. But it is a view that stresses continuity and wholeness, a broader sense of responsibility. And at its best, it envisions the cultivation of a, dim of a multi-dimensional sense of the professional self. On the other hand, it is a vision that assumes that one size fits all, that each faculty member is expected to be excellent in everything. Sound familiar? Uh, teaching, research, institutional service, responsibilities for community engagement. For the individual, it is an over overly demanding standard particularly in this highly differentiated, complex world in which we, we work. I hope you've all had a chance to read at one time or another uh, Robert Kagan's book, In Over Our Heads. He really talks about that, and it isn't just higher education, it isn't just faculty that have this sense that some of you I know are, are struggling with. Uh, but it's a part of our time. It's a part of the differentiation. I am, a so I think, sociologically. It's that process of specialization, and we keep pushing it out in every area, in every institution. And people are struggling with being in over our heads. In our interviews with early career faculty, early on we interviewed people in good liberal arts colleges where this one-size-fits-all approach was institutionalized. And a number of them talked about experiencing particularly at tenure time, uh, a pattern of humiliation. If they can't catch you on this, they'll get you on that. And there is a kind of general fear that uh, this, this model um, is too pervasive and, uh, and in a sense is inappropriate, or is inappropriate for our time. Institutionally, many of our liberal arts colleges, and I got this from a group of presidents meeting in Washington. They said, you know, we have a, a business plan that is no longer viable. But we always think that competition is going to cut the cost. But in the liberal arts college, uh, competition raises cost. So if your institution builds a fitness center, the, uh, the college down the, the road has to have a fitness center. If they get the new economists coming out and go with some of the star faculty, the college down the road has to do the same. So tuition has escalated. And we've all stood on the side, particularly if you're not in one of those colleges, and looked on and saying, hey, can, I kid, can my kids go to those kinds of institutions? Um, 
private liberal arts colleges, it seems to me, are clearly out of the reach of most of, our, of the population. And when you project into the future, it is, in fact, scary. Um, this first academic model of academic excellence is one that I admire and uh, have benefited from, and in fact, they had tuition exchange at the private university where I taught, and both of my kids, I was at one time almost making more in tuition exchange dollars than I was making in salary. So uh, I have, uh, they've eliminated those programs uh, since then, uh, or have kept track who's going where, and there are some schools you can't go to. Um, but I've really appreciated it and benefited from this model. In fact, I've even written in defense of the complete scholar as a sense of wholeness. Um, unfortunately, I'm having a tough time making that argument these days. The second model uh, of academic excellence is one with which we are all probably most familiar. And toward the latter part of the 19th century, this radical new approach to scholarship became part of, uh, of our life academically, and we had people, our scholars, going to Europe to get their PhDs and returning with a different vision of what it means to be uh, a real scholar. And they brought with them the graduate school experience, the graduate seminar, the research laboratory, and it began to be introduced at Johns Hopkins, then the University of Chicago, and then at Berkeley. Uh, and in fact, it was a fairly small group, and they sat one day, and uh, Lee Shulman is fond of telling the story about their being in San Francisco, the people that were forming this new American university. And uh, as they, they, they really went through the debate, do you have undergraduates in those programs, or should they be research institutes? And the decision was made not to do that. And two days later, the earthquake hit San Francisco. He thinks that it might have had something, uh, a divine intervention or statement there. Um, but that was a major decision, to have the university include both undergraduates and these graduate programs. And there have been important consequences there. But scholarly work narrowed and was defined increasingly as specialized, discipline-based research. Now, most of our professional disciplines were organized formally into associations between 1870 and 1920. Think about your own association. And it was a time when we defined the discipline, and we're still living with that, and the departments that came out of those. So the, the disciplines and the departments shape the organizational reality that many of us are living with now. And, uh, and you're, <laughs> you're here trying to reorganize things. And I notice um, the dean sitting here on the, on the front row uh, probably looking for help. How do you put <laughs> the humanities and uh, the natural sciences together? I'm, I mean, you're, you're doing some wonderful things and, uh, and you're raising uh, serious questions, and we'll all be looking your way. And you need to make that work public. You need to make it visible so that uh, other institutions can benefit from what you're doing. This vision, however, was articulated best by probably the one scholar I have taken most seriously in my life, Max Weber. Um, but he articulated it in a lecture that was demanded by his students, interesting, entitled Sciences of Vocation. It was delivered in, 18, in 1918 at the University of Munich. But Weber in that essay speaks eloquently about the inner desire that drives the scholar on the cutting edge of the field. He talks about the ecstasy, and it almost has an erotic, I mean, when he writes about this, the power of being on the very cutting edge uh, of a new field and having the joy of that breakthrough. 
uh, the excitement of that. And he says, that's the life of the scholar, to be able to, uh, to be at that point. The real joy in work, the real sense of vocation. In the United States, it wasn't until after the World War II and uh, even after Sputnik and the launching of Sputnik by the Soviets in 1957 that this mode of excellence became uh, the dominant strength. It also was encouraged by the, by the uh, Cold War and the infusion of federal funds, scientific research. Uh, some of us remember there being defense fellowships that would take you through to the PhD. Uh, but here it became fully institutionalized. Research, or scholarship, as we talked about it, uh, became research. Vocation became a profession. Departments became the organizational expression of that vision. In the 1960s, higher education moved into a period of rapid expansion and affluence. And a consensus emerged from that, during that period, that I've described elsewhere as the assumptive work of the academic professional. Whoops. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk later uh, about technology and the importance of it, and uh, I don't want any of you to make comments <laughs> about the, <laughs> the way in which I'm using it because it could be an embarrassment. <laughs> but the assumptive world of the academic professional, now think of that period, that heyday of higher education, when it was taking off, and in our consciousness as faculty, research became the central professional endeavor and the focus of academic life. Quality, when you want to talk about quality, it's preserved through peer review and the maintenance of professional autonomy. Don't tell me what to do, leave me alone. Uh, and I'll push through. The pursuit of knowledge was best organized according to discipline. Reputations were established in national and international professional associations. Professional rewards and mobility accrued to those who persistently accentu uh, accentuated their specialization. So if you moved into an adjacent field or if you did some of this stuff uh, like you're trying to do, getting into the community, uh, you're really getting off track. Um, I'm reminded of that ad for, I uh, forget which one of the companies it is, where there's the green line and you have to stay on the line. Well, well there was a line that was, was established. Fidelity, <laughs> right? Um, professional w rewards and mobility accrued to those who, accent who accentuated their specialization. And the distinctive task of the academic professional is the pursuit of cognitive truth. This is a line from Talcott Parsons, with whom I'd studied, and uh, he really meant it. He didn't have a television set. It was cognitive truth, and you stayed with that. This professional vision and the interrelated related complex of assumptions on which it was built contributed to a major leap forward in the advancement of knowledge and social inventions, and we have to recognize that. It is one of the reasons we can, spend, we can speak, and I hesitate to do this, but we can speak about the 20th century as the American century. But this came, this development, these developments came at a very high price. For, for faculty, PhD programs and graduates proliferated at a time when the number of academic appointments in many fields was dwindling. I mean, you look at the charts and it's just incredible. PhDs were being ground out and jobs were disappearing, creating a serious situation. As most of us know and some of us experienced, adjunct and part-time faculty began to be blatantly exploited and in a lot of institutions, that's still the case. Uh, the integrity of tenure, and I want to defend tenure, uh, but the integrity of tenure was undermined. 
it became, rather than being primarily the defender of academic freedom and open inquiry, became uh, increasingly a mechanism for job protection and uh, protecting seniority. Now, I'm among those older folks that have benefited from that, but uh, this is hardly defensible. Um, a hierarchy was developed that drove a wedge between senior faculty and junior faculty. And one of the ironies that I really am struck by as I visit campus after campus is the people that have been denied academic freedom, which was why we set up tenure, are often the junior faculty that are coming up for tenure because they have to uh, be politically correct. They have to mind, they have to stay on that green track uh, and not get off. And yet uh, tenure was intended to protect academic freedom and the freedom of inquiry. This is the genius of American higher education. And yet in the development of this model and the way it has evolved, why tenure has become something else. For students, this mode of academic excellence was financed on, they were piggybacked on the backs of undergraduates, tuition, funding priorities, fees. The lecture became the dominant mode of instruction, not because it's the best way to teach, it's not, um, but because it's cost effective. Low division, low division, lower division class size increased and teaching assistants, rather than being mentored, it could be a wonderful process of mentoring new faculty as they're coming along. And we desperately need that. And there have been a number of really good efforts at that by the graduate programs. But uh, rather than teaching assistants being mentored, we've used them to serve this increased teaching load. Again, exploitation of the apprentice faculty and I think that will, there will be a price to pay there in the future. The curriculum, which was, struct was structured to meet the needs of faculty, not of the students and their needs for learning. General education was cannibalized. I was chair of the sociology department at that time, and I remember participating in that, insisting that we get our share of those general education distribution requirements. And uh, I remember going into those meetings and hustling for it. Uh, and uh, probably ought to apologize. Uh, <laughs> in the majority of the colleges and universities, faculty priorities and rewards moved in one direction and the mission of the institution moved in another. The increased increasing of a diverse student body. Uh, the demands for knowledge, a knowledge base in larger and larger communities. So the mission of the institutions moved in that direction and faculty priorities, given this notion of excellence, moved in another. The model that emerged encouraged faculty to became, become individual entrepreneurs, focusing more on my work than our work. And that that's an enormous cultural barrier to what you're trying to do uh, to any kind of new model that we, we might try to present. But moving from my work to our work, and how do you make that cultural shift psychologically and institutionally. It is a professional model that at the extreme has become increasingly more competitive, exclusive, and hierarchical. Robert Bella, a professor now at Berkeley, um, I think one of our most thoughtful social philosophers, in commenting on the impact of specialization on our universities and particularly on faculty, he's observed that the process of differentiation can no longer be sustained. Differentiation has gone about as far as it can go. It's time for a new reintegration. 
and I want to talk a lot more about that. Okay, in the past 20 years, we've been in a major transition, if not transformation. Um, now, during these years, since 1990, I think, uh, there's been sizable creativity and innovation, and you've, a number of you have participated in that. A period of remarkable intellectual development. Uh, people like Lee Shulman, Donald Schoen, have really led the way there. You could just establish a, a list. A time that has moved us toward a different view of academic excellence, and I'm suggesting we think about this as a third way. That worked, see? Um, so part of that change I see you catch here, the changing role of faculty, a shift from focus on faculty, who we are and what we know, to a focus on learning. Now I think we're making that shift in a fundamental way, and the things I've seen around here and that Christy talked about this morning, you're, you're in the middle of that. Whether or not you can make the next jump, which is another now move to student development and community engagement. I think that's a big question, but an important challenge. So um, that's a part of this, of this third way. A major change is change in what we are learning. We're going through a pedagogical revolution, literally. And it's because of the research on learning. So the research is paying off here, and we're learning about how people learn. And what's emerged are three central thrusts. Active, experience-based learning, things like service learning, undergraduate research. The second one is the power of relational learning. I remember reading Soren Kierkegaard and he's saying all learning is relational. This was back in the 19th century. Uh, but the power of relational learning. And here we're learning more about peer learning, learning communities where people learn, students learn from peers. And we're just beginning to pick up on that and then technology enhances that. Um, but the third then is technologically enhanced learning, web-based, social networks, distance learning, I don't know where you are on that. Uh, it often gets put down and has become something that uh, entrepreneurs have picked up on and run with and, is, and set up um, for-profit universities. So some of us have really negative views. I think it's here to stay and we're gonna have to do it, but we're gonna have to do it smarter. And there are places where they're developing a blended model and using e-portfolios e uh, as a way of uh, keeping track of the development of competencies rather than courses. And we're moving beyond courses. But this is a pedagogical revolution that we need to take seriously. Some of you know the Nessie Project in, in Indiana. And, uh, Um, these higher impact practices, George Koo has published an essay on that, and you can get it online. But uh, just look at that list. What are the high impact practices? Those first year seminars that you're talking about here, common intellectual experiences, learning communities, writing intensive courses, and what a neglect, you know, when we started to really move into our studies and do our research, uh, you had to require fewer written papers. And in fact, you can trace it. It's happened. And uh, students aren't writing. And uh, an extraordinary, extraordinary way to, um, to get people to think. And uh, my wife is a faculty member and she has a lot of, um, international students, and I just admire the late nights she spends marking up those papers. She really helps people write. And, uh, you know, she's gotten teaching awards, but that's what she needs to get awarded for, 
is that serious, the serious way in which she's taking writing. Um, you look down that list, collaboration, collaborative assignments, undergraduate research, that's taking off. MIT is into it so that 86% of their undergraduates have some connection with faculty research. And they really are, are making a, a strong case for, for that approach. Service learning, community-based learning, internships, capstone courses. Now, as you look down that list, all are active, relational, experience-based, also collaborative. We need to rethink the way in which we do our teaching. And each one of these has become, almost every one of them, has become a movement during the last 20 years. So service learning really has become a movement. We had a conference last week out in San Francisco, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, and it was entitled Global Positioning. You know, it's a recession. We didn't expect people to come. That it was in San Francisco probably helped. <laughs> but we, in fact, had the largest attendance in the history of the association. But it was the global focus. We all, we're, we're all not sure about what's going on there. But we know that uh, real intellectual inquiry is often collaborative. Um, and it's comparative that you get that comparative perspective that you get in another culture from visiting there, from being there, from bringing it in in different ways. And this is a challenge we've got to pick up on. Most of the new approaches to learning, however, have been add-ons. We've been doing well enough that uh, if you're in a growing mode, why you can bring new things in without challenging the core and you bring them in at the periphery. And that's what we've done organizationally. We've take, taken an additive approach to organizational change. And uh, that actually has made things worse, not better, and has really put the squeeze on faculty, and particularly early career faculty. We did these interviews with early career faculty, 3,000 across the country. Um, and the way they most characterize their working lives is they keep using the term, and it's the same term that emerges in a number of the interviews entitled, we made it, The Overflowing Plate. Um, you look down that left-hand side, and uh, what you have there is that old assumptive world. It's all in place. You look down the right side, and you get what uh, faculty are now having to attend to. So it isn't just research. Research is still there, but teaching, professional engagement. It's not professional autonomy, but public accountability. And accountability is here in a big way. Peer review but also heavy reliance on student evaluations and the assessment of learning. You have an office of assessment. Uh, not only focus on the discipline, but cross, crossing knowledge domains. So you can just go down that list and compare it with the other. And it isn't that we've dropped off things on your left, but uh, we've added the things on the right. So enormous pressures. And, uh, um, and faculty are having to deal with that. And I would hope that in talking about this third way, we would take seriously the quality of life of faculty and uh, um, the balance that we can cultivate there. I think we've neglected that. Um, well, anyhow, the Carnegie Foundation, in, I was at Princeton in the 90s, working with Ernest Boyer, and we developed Scholarship Reconsidered. And uh, most of you are familiar with this, but it's a part of this whole discussion. And I want us to move it ahead. I've been spending the last 20 years looking at 
at schools that have tried to take this seriously. And our memory is often short. Institutions that have advanced it, and then you visit them, and uh, they've backed up. And uh, you have to go back in and kind of refresh their memories. But I want you to look around that, that chart. Um, this is an attempt to provide uh, a more holistic view of academic work. And I want to say the scholarship of discovery is really important, and particularly in schools that take teaching seriously. It's important that all of us be scholars. All of us have an intellectual project. All of us be learning. You can't be a teacher without being a learner. So scholarly work, I'm not saying it has to be published in the leading refereed journal, but that intellectual vitality, that intellectual life, that spark has to be there with faculty. And in your recruitment, you need to really pay attention to that. Everyone needs this intellectual project. We need to be learners. The scholarship of teaching and learning has taken off and uh, really has been what has gone on at the Carnegie Foundation under the leadership of Lee Shulman. I think his single most important contribution was getting us beyond um, the content process split that really has um, undermined the teaching enterprise. Uh, it's been the albatross around the necks of schools of education. It's assumed that teaching deals, that education deals with process, with technique, with how you do it, and that the disciplines deal with content. We're getting beyond that now. Now technology, I think, is, is paving the way for that. You can't separate content and process. Um, but in the Carnegie Scholars program that they set up there, they would bring in people in fields and then have them talk about the exciting intellectual subject matter and, uh, and how you relate that to teaching and that it, they aren't separated. And I, I hope we're on the other side of that and that the future, the American University, will assume that content and process go together. And even some of the disciplinary associations are beginning to buy that. But that whole focus on uh, teaching also needs to become public. You need to have an opportunity here to get together and talk about your teaching, your failures as well as your successes, um, about the process and what you're learning and how students learn and how shiftly, how quickly that ground is shifting. We could go on all day about the scholarship of teaching and learning, but the one where I've had my heart is in the scholarship of engagement. Uh, there are a few um, universities in North America uh, that have made community engagement and the scholarship of engagement as the prototype for excellence for their institutions. You look at Syracuse University and they talk about it as scholarship in action. Portland State has a walkway right there in the middle of the city, uh, you know, kind of going from the city to the university and on it it reads, let knowledge serve the city. Wagner College has established that small, uh, sleepy Staten Island College has become a vital place because of the emphasis on engagement and the internships in uh, Manhattan. And it's just really transformed it. Uh, the University of uh, Northern Kentucky, you could go on down Michigan State, a list of those who have picked up on this form of scholarship and it opens a very different understanding of scholarly work. And uh, of the three kinds of uh, what we require of, of faculty in the traditional model, teaching, research, and students. And what we're getting, and what I want to contend for, is a basic epistemological shift. 
Um, this is a shift in how we go about knowing. So it's a different relationship with students. You focus on student learning and their development, on their making meaning. So it isn't just what we say, it's how they respond and are listening to their questions. That's what they want. Um, but a different relationship with students, a different kind of research, community-based research, research that is reciprocal, and particularly in the social fields, social inquiry, community partners are important. Sociology, we have largely used uh, the community partners to gather data, and then we go to conferences, conferences and share it with one another. And the community uh, is a kind of sideshow. This is a calls for a different approach to research. Honoring local as well as cosmopolitan knowledge. Um, a different relationship with the community. And in fact, in the past few years, the, um, the words that were used in scholarship reconsidered have been changed. It isn't the application of knowledge. It's the scholarship of engagement. Application of knowledge bought the epistemology of the old model. We develop it in the university and then we apply it to them. And uh, we're, we've backed off that now and are beginning to talk about the scholarship of engagement. Honoring the wisdom of practice. This is a part of this shift. And then, as was referred to earlier, the, stewardships, the stewardship of place, the ask you project. I hope you're reading Donald Schoen's Reflective Practitioner, which shows the relationship between um, knowledge generation and experience. In fact, I find it said best, um, sociologists often do this, when you uh, want to say something important, you go to the poets. And uh, on the power of the relationship between intellectual development and active practice, I think William Butler Yeats says it best. The human soul is always moving outward into the external world and inward into itself. But this movement is double because the human soul would not be conscious were it not suspended between contraries. The greater the contrast, the more intense the consciousness. Okay, I just think that's a powerful statement. And, uh, and service learning, when it's done right, really builds on that. Uh, Community-based research does the same. So I think there's a future in this, this whole approach. The form of scholarship that has been most neglected is the scholarship of integration and synthesis. And I urge you to pick up and, and run with that. Uh, is beginning to get uh, increased attention. Where the pieces come together, where the parts make a whole, where the disciplines are transcended but built on, not neglected, but built on so that we don't go back to a simpler time. And the walls that separate us come down. This is the most neglected form of scholarly work. I'm going to skip over so we've got some time for uh, there for those of you who've been through the reading, some of the issues, the other challenges that we're all struggling with. One that I find particularly engaging is this tension between uh, the collegial culture and the managerial culture. This is development that I think uh, is really challenging. Both models that I've been talking about are on the left. It's the collegial culture. But, and both models are driven by uh, a market. And on the uh, collegial, collegial culture, you have the prestige economy. And I can't say too much about that. And then the market economy on the other side. And here are two cultures that are vying for the future of the university. And uh, we need to take that seriously and move toward a collaborative culture where we learn to work together. 
They need to understand us on the collegial side. We need to understand them on the managerial side. We need to work together. We need to develop networks of learning that include both of the best features of these two cultures. And now just a final word about the uh, third way. Some are even talking about a Copernican moment. Now I'm not sure the sun's gonna change position, but uh, <laughs> I do think uh, changes are taking place. But here are the characteristics that why I want us to think about. I want a notion of scholarly excellence that is integrated but differentiated. Beyond the discipline and the department, we need to reorganize the way in which we do our work. We need to build on the advancements of specialization, not return to a simpler past. This really is important because so much, in fact, this is the sociological definition of fundamentalism that you, you reduce, you go back to a simpler past. And that's the temptation of all of us. There was a time when things worked. But uh, we can't build the future by doing that. We've got to find ways, new ways of integration, building on what we gain from specialization. And as you think about your disciplines, think about your teaching areas, well, I hope you'll think about that. It needs to be more collaborative beyond hierarchy and competitiveness, and yet allowing for individuation and creative freedom. Professional autonomy needs to be talked about, but it's not just independence and our doing our own thing. Uh, it's protecting the university as a place where questions are raised and, uh, and that we do it in a manner that has integrity. Uh, I don't know whether some of you saw Inside Job on the financial collapse, but uh, if you get a chance, well, I see it, the academy just gets decimated. I mean, our best faculty get on there and they're making two and three hundred thousand uh, dollar fees, you know, for turning out these uh, um, studies of Iceland for one, talks about what a great system it is, and it's surviving and it's moving forward just before the collapse. And then I won't tell you the dean of what school it was, but he just changed the, his um, uh, CV and talked about the insecurity of Iceland rather than uh, its stability. Didn't change the report at all and made $200,000, and they asked him about it. I mean, they, it's a hatchet job, and they went after him, and he ended up by just saying, get out of my office. <laughs> but uh, the Academy doesn't come across looking very, very good in that film, but we need to see it. And then we need to nurture that collaborative culture between the collegial culture and the managerial. And then we need to be inclusive, moving beyond diversity. And this needs to be an interdependent global consciousness that influences this. Recognizing diversity as an educational value and a catalyst. And I think that is increasingly demonstrated, but doing it in a way that it is part of an inclusive whole. And I think we've pushed on the diversity side, we haven't pushed beyond to inclusion and inclusion of everybody. And then an engagement, an engaged campus beyond walls and silos. The relationship between theory and practice needs to be rethought. The cosmopolitan and the local, the shift from walls and silos to webs and networks. And then the final, toward a network culture with new technologies uh, that will change what we know and how we learn. Some of you know Clifford Gertz, the anthropologist. I think of the social sciences, he was one of our best. He wrote an article a number of years ago entitled uh, Blurred Genres. And he says, something is happening to the way we think about the way we think. Now, the World Wide Web, the internet, 
Everything is interconnected. Process and content are fundamentally intertwined. I mean, your students can also go to the internet and do their own research. Um, as, as faculty, we are at a tipping point in what we know and do and who we do it with. In closing, I want, I am reminded of C. Wright Mill's essay, uh, An Intellectual Craftsmanship. And in there he wrote, scholarship is a choice of how to live as well as a choice of a career. Scholarship is the choice of how we live as well as a choice of career. Integrity, wholeness, connectedness. There's a spiritual dimension here. Jane Tompkins was reflecting on her life as a faculty member. She wrote a book about it. And uh, the last line, she says, what do I want from work? And here's her list. A sense of contribution, a common enterprise, belonging, a good feeling in the workplace, a community of hope, an integrated life. And I wish that for you. Uh, and you're, you can be leading the way as we struggle through uh, this emerging third way. So let me stop there. I apologize for going on so long. This is just a, a problem <laughs> that I've got, and I've been socialized in the old way uh, too much. So I had to demonstrate how you don't do it. Okay, is there questions? My name is uh, Lee Zeitz. I'm in the, from the College of Education. And I'm one of the uh, instructional technology nerds. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the things that we're finding right now is that in uh, the schools, we are seeing um, technology-rich learning environments occurring. And the idea where every student has a laptop and, and the things are happening. But the thing is that it's not about the hardware. It's about the curriculum, about reorganizing the whole system. And we need to prepare our students for that, our, our, our candidates that we're putting out into the field. This is a huge, a monumental task. Um, any ideas, suggestions <laughs> about reorganizing the way we, what we do? Well, I've, you know, as a faculty member, I have a book to recommend. Uh, <laughs> Mark Taylor's book uh, really focuses on uh, networking and how this is becoming. This is part of the wave of the future, and uh, that we've got to respond to that. And it's going to be global. It won't be just American. It just won't be local. And we've got to take full advantage of that. Now, your question is about how do we get, it isn't a hardware problem. No, no, no. I, I acknowledge what you're saying about networking and global and all that stuff. But what I'm saying is that we have a system that's put into our program, you know, our educational college, College of Education. And we have people who have been doing things for many years. And the question is, how do we make the change? What, what do we do as, as far as moving everybody in that direction? Or do you have suggestions? Well, I think critical is doing something about the way future faculty are prepared. And I think that will, and it's happening. Uh, I'm on the board of this CERTL, Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And they now have 10 other research universities that are focusing on how students use technology in the teaching. So uh, good things are, are happening there, but we don't want to say, as so many people are saying now, the faculty is the problem. We've got to get at the vanguard of this. We need to be providing the leadership and, uh, and doing things uh, in new ways. Yeah, thank you. Why don't you stand, Laura? Okay. Um, 
I, I enjoyed your speech and your talk and uh, want to read more because I agree with so much. Um, the trend towards hiring presidents who are former military or corporate uh, individuals, and uh, just as you said, the faculty usually gets blamed, but how do you make such a shift with so much of that market side taking over universities? Yeah. You notice in these two models, uh, the leadership comes from the corporate sector or from law. They're not peers. See, in the collegial culture, leadership, presidents, uh, went up the ranks. You know, you were a faculty member, you became a department chair, you went through the hoops. Uh, now we're beginning to recognize we need to bring in these managers, partly because the management issue is such a com complex one. But now your question is, why are we doing this and what? Uh, well, I, I understand you're saying we need to incorporate, integrate the cultures. But, um, well, let's, let's face it. A lot of the people who are coming in on that managerial cultural model are pretty um, entrenched in their own, in their what own they way. call knowledge and experience and the right way to do Right. And there's a fundamental educational process going over on here. Uh, the, managers, the managers don't understand tenure. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of things, academic freedom, they don't understand. Uh, and we need to educate them in that. Um, their concern for the budget. Uh, there are a lot of things about efficiency. We need to listen to them as well. So it needs to be a genuine collaborative culture, one that becomes a learning community where we learn from one another and we overcome prejudices that are really um, ingrained in these older uh, academic models of excellence. As and who facilitates that coming together? Well, the president, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you just... <laughs> Well, I think the, uh, the faculty needs to take the leadership. There's a governance issue here that we've got to work through. Uh, and it's particularly difficult where you have a collective bargaining unit. Uh, but you have a unit through which to work. And uh, maybe we'll learn something about democracy as we interact with these other countries that are, that are struggling with it. But um, the governance issue is a fundamental part of this. And the faculty need to be involved. It can't just be taken away. They can't continue to say, well, if you ask faculty, they'll form a committee and they'll talk it to death. That's too true. <laughs> I mean, we really need to, uh, to get in there and do our research ahead of time and, uh, and work together effectively and in a timely manner. But uh, we need to be involved in that. But that's a good question. We do have a lunch program today, but we are also allowing time for table discussion because that's part of why we're here today, is to learn more about what others are doing across campus and find those opportunities for networking and collaboration, right? So I'm glad that you're enjoying the conversation. When the lunch program wraps up, there will be some additional time for conversation as well. So. Just want you to know that the lunch program is brief. I do want to take the time now to introduce the members of our symposium planning team. Actually, I didn't bring my, Anita, could you grab my list? Is in my yellow folder there. Sorry. Now, before I do that, I do want to take the opportunity to thank the members of the OSP team who are here today, who are, all, we have shut down the office. I'm sorry, Gloria. I realize that's probably not okay, but in emergency, phone calls are being forwarded to one of our numbers. <laughs> yes. And the, I think the message says if you really need something urgently, we're in the union. <laughs> you can find one of us. That, has, that one right there has the.
Okay, I see some of the members of the Office of Sponsored Programs back at that table. Wave. See, so we've got Nancy Yuska, Mary Chin, Michelle Mulling Sheehan, Paul Bilo is around here somewhere as well. We've got Christina, I think I see you back there. She's our highly capable graduate student. We've had the help of Hillary Oberly, Sarah Bridges, Lori Burke, who keeps all of us sane by keeping everything pulled together. Certainly our symposium planning chair, Anita Gordon, would like to thank her as well for her, extra her extraordinary work on this since last May. And forgetting, any, we've got Lori Miller around here somewhere as well too. So those are the OSP uh, planning team assistants there. I appreciate everything that you do on a daily basis for you and I, as well as in association with this event today. Since last summer, the conference, the symposium planning team has been meeting, I think we started probably every other week initially, so we've had extraordinary assistance from throughout campus. A team of associate deans and faculty have been coming together since then. Brenda Bass, Sarah Bridges from our office, Kavita Danwada, Kavita with us, she just, okay. John Fritch, and Anita has been sharing that group. Mary Herring, Mohammed Rawas, Jesse Swan, Barry Wilson, Leslie Wilson, and Catherine Zeman. Please give both my uh, OSP team and the, the symposium planning team a round of applause. I would now like to introduce our provost for some welcoming remarks since she had to be Ben this morning. She was not able to provide those this morning. She wanted to take an opportunity to uh, welcome you all to this event today. It's not easy being Ben. Um, I do want to welcome everyone uh, to this event, and I think what I'd like to do is for us to pause and thank Christy for all of her hard work, please. We've had a great morning with our keynote address and our breakout sessions. Uh, I attended the one on rigor. Um, and we had uh, a lot of, um, I don't know if we came to consensus on everything, but we had a great, great discussion. And um, I think we, uh, a lot of major points uh, were made in that session, and I'm sure that's uh, true of your sessions as well. Uh, I think the afternoon, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it, and uh, our presentations during lunch, um, but I want to thank you all uh, for taking time out of your busy, busy day, because I know how busy you are, uh, to attend this symposium. And uh, I hope that this is just the beginning of conversations, that they won't end when this day ends, but that we take the ideas that we have um, learned and discussed during the day, take those back to our various departments uh, where we can continue the dialogue. So thank you and uh, let's enjoy the rest of the day. You will find at your tables several documents, one of which is University of Northern Iowa award recipients, fiscal year, 2009-2010. You might recall if you attended our 2009 symposium that we recognized the uh, scholarly award recipients from throughout the institution. 
one of the things I had noticed when I came into OSP and was first really campus-wide was that we have a lot of tremendous things happening in our colleges, but we don't always have the venues where those, whether it's our scholarship or excellent teaching, can be uplifted to the entire campus um, community. So we did recognize scholarly award recipients from each of the various scholars, from each of the various colleges at that time. Since we decided to have our symposium only every other year, I say in our office it's rather like childbirth. You have to be far enough removed from the pain to be willing to do it again. <laughs> because we are a rather small office and it is an enormous amount of, of work to do this. We have numerous recipients and we wanted to recognize more than just the research award recipients this time. So this program is quite extensive and please do take a moment to look through that and see all of the various award recipients in all of the different colleges. If you have an opportunity today to meet any of these individuals, ask them about their award in teaching and why they received that or their various research awards that they've received or their Viridian Credit Union Community Engagement Award and what was the work that they received that for. I would like to take this opportunity just to congratulate all of the award recipients in the past two years. I know what you do on behalf of you and I, and we'd like to thank you for that. You have another document at your table, an intellectual property and technology transfer brochure. We thought one of, when we were first meeting as a symposium planning team, we talked about how scholarship has changed over the years. And part of that has been this ex, these expectations for universities nationally to become more engaged in technology transfer and commercialization. We don't have a lot of opportunities across campus to find out exactly what that is, what it entails, and what services are available to assist you in those endeavors. So if you're interested in securing a patent or seeing if your work is potentially patentable, or copyrights, and what are trademarks, and how do you obtain those. There's the Intellectual Property Committee as referenced in this brochure, as well as our Intellectual Property Officer. I'd like to take the opportunity to have Randy Pilkington who is the Executive Director of Business and Community Services, who heads up our technology transfer efforts on campus, just provide you a brief summary of our technology transfer services and efforts at the university, as well as Ron Padovich talk just briefly about intellectual property. Thank you, Christy. I'm Randy Pilkington, Director of Business and Community Services here at UNI. Before I start though, I think there, a very important part of what happened already today came out of our professional learning community's little, work, or little breakout group this morning. And it was said that these collaborative opportunities and to really have learning communities on campus, it seems like OSP is really filling the void to bring us together for these types of activities. So I think Christy and her staff deserve a lot of credit for these types of activities from the Conexus we had to this symposium, because without this, I'm not sure we would all get together and, and have these opportunities. So congratulations to, and thank you for Christy and all the staff of OSP for doing this. <clears throat> this morning you heard uh, Dr. Rice talk about the scholarship of community engagement. Love the presentation. And I think what we do at Business and Community Services as, as the umbrella group for all of our economic, economic development and tech transfer is we provide that opportunity for the scholarship of community engagement. We're the front door to this university through many different aspects. One is we're in all 99 counties across the state of Iowa. Another way is we had more than 2,100 students last year involved in, in projects in communities 
across the state of Iowa or in classroom projects brought to you through the business and community services areas. We work with the communities and the local governments across the state. We work with uh, entrepreneurs and, and local government and in the environment and sustainability. There's programs representing all colleges across the university and we hold us, hold us up as one, one stop for outreach, for economic development and tech transfer across the state and uh, the one contact then through the Board of Regents. So that's what Business and Community Services is about. We have a booth down in the poster session. If you have any questions, please stop by. We'd love to talk to you. We'd like to find a way if you have any, if you would like to have a deeper participation, either to find a project for your classroom, if you would like to be more engaged in what happens out in the community, and by the community, we're talking Iowa and beyond in what we do. So we hope to have that opportunity. Now, an important part of what we do with outreach is technology transfer. And Ron Padovich has been filling in with two other roles as the intellectual property officer. has been doing a very fine job, and he is here to talk a little bit more about intellectual property and technology transfer. Thanks. Thank you, Randy. Good afternoon. As Christy said, there's a brochure on the table in front of you that talks a little bit about uh, intellectual property and the disclosure process. You'll see in that brochure that we've defined intellectual property as any intangible or tangible product that's developed using university resources. The interesting thing about that is that university policy basically says that if you're using university resources and you develop intellectual property, you need to disclose that to the university. And there are a few benefits to disclosing. Number one, if you do disclose, you're in compliance with university policy. But also, um, it establishes the ownership and the date of the creation. And what that really does is it helps protect your intellectual property from infringement or unauthorized use. So if someone should find out about your intellectual property or use it in, a, in a, uh, a way that you have not assigned to them or the university has not assigned to them, we can go back and say that was a creation here at the University of Northern Iowa and we have documentation to prove when that intellectual property was created. So there's a protection element to you as you do your scholarly work and your research work. So the process is fairly simple. We've tried to streamline this process of disclosure as much as possible. We have a one-page disclosure form that we'll have you complete if you want to disclose or you have something to disclose. It just asks some very basic questions about your technology. And here again, it's used to record the date that you actually developed your intellectual property and are claiming that for yourself. And this disclosure basically acknowledges to the university that you have this intellectual property. Uh, and also what your intent is. Perhaps your intent is that you want this intellectual property to be used for the public good. Uh, there's a possibility you might want to start a spin-off business. Uh, there's all types of different arrangements that can be made with intellectual property. Uh, you might want to commercialize that, license it to some commercial operation, and then collect a royalty off of that, which is shared by the university. If, uh, when you complete the intellectual property disclosure form, the intellectual property committee will review that. We'll look at that to see if there's commercial potential for it and if there's something in there that can be patented. If that's the case, uh, we, we could really call that the feasibility stage. We'll do market research. We'll go out and we'll look at the marketplace to determine where this intellectual property might fit. If we determine that there's a commercial value in this intellectual property, we'll go to the UNI Research Foundation and ask that they pay for patenting. Now, patenting will cost anywhere from ten to $25,000, and that's at no cost to you. So the, the UNI Research Foundation has agreed to do that in cases where we've found uh, commercial viability for some of the intellectual property here on campus. And then we'll also work with you to find someone uh, specifically that might want to license that technology. Once that's done, you're entitled to royalty payments. Uh, on the first $100,000 of royalty that comes to the university, you will get 50% of that, and the university will get 25%, or 50%, I'm sorry, 25% goes to your department, and another 25% goes to the university. So what we've done, once again, is we've tried to uh, make this process as simple and straightforward as we possibly can. And uh, as I sat around today, and I was in the collaborative uh, research section today, the, the uh, breakout session, and we're always looking for a collaborative relationships here at the university. Our speaker this morning talked about that. Uh, our goal, and my goal as intellectual property officer, is to work with you, not to be a roadblock to you, but to help facilitate what it is you want to accomplish with your intellectual property. So thank you very much. I look forward to working with you.
Thank you, Randy and Ron. And we do really appreciate the facilitation role that you provide. Certainly that is something that we try, strive hard in our office to be facilitators of what you wish to do on campus as opposed to this sort of trying to, to drive it or to police it, enforce it. So certainly with intellectual property, we do that as well. Let us be facilitators, answer your questions, explore with you if this makes sense, this route makes sense for you. You don't have to be, sometimes there's this thought in academia that if you wish to disclose something and have intellectual property that you need to then develop that into a business enterprise because that's been done here before at UNI. But there are multiple venues for intellectual property. It can become a spin-off that you can be incubated in our accelerator here on campus to develop, but it can be licensed as well to an existing industry or perhaps a new startup that wants to license that. So that's from a patenting perspective. So sometimes people think, I might not want to disclose because I don't want to start my own business. You don't have to start your own business. But there are numerous opportunities you can benefit from that disclosure anyway by having the royalties where a business has licensed your intellectual property. I do want to introduce Jesse Swan now is going to or MC the next part of our program. We did want to take the opportunity today to showcase all of our scholarship and creative activity at the university. Not just research, but recognize that we have tremendous creative works happening here at UNI. So we have, we're going to take the opportunity to um, show some of those to you, including having a poetry reading today. <clears throat> As Christy just said, we've um, selected three works by creative scholars um, for our plenary presentation at today's uh, symposium. I'll introduce each one right before he or she um, presents. And so first, we will hear a selection of original poems by Jeremy Schraffenberger. Jeremy has published widely and is already developing a distinctive voice among contemporary American poets. <clears throat> Jeremy is praised widely as in being characterized as someone who has yet to write a poem that sounds like the product of a writing program and being someone whose best poetry compares favorably with that of Rita Dove, Norman Duby, and Charles Bukowski. Jeremy's poetry has appeared in many prestigious publications, including the publication he is now assistant editor of, The North American Review, which has the distinction of being the first literary magazine of the United States, being founded in Boston in 1815, and for many decades now being published here at UNI. Interwoven with Jeremy's original poems will be a selection of poems by one of UNI's most remarkable 20th century professors, the estimable Iowa farmer and poet, James Hurst. Jeremy, who is walking up now, will read for about seven minutes. Don't clap yet, you haven't heard it. Thanks, Jesse. That was really nice. Um, I was just thinking what goes best with chicken. It's poetry, of course. Um, I'm going to read, actually, I'm only going to read four poems, and only two of them I've written, so you won't have to suffer through them too much. Uh, and I did want to take my selection from Hearst from the North American Review, as Jesse mentioned, I work for. And this is old Jim Hearst. Some of you may remember him. This was an issue published in 74, um, honoring his <clears throat> life and work. So. I'm gonna read one of his poems and then read one of mine. This is called Limited View. The clutter and ruck of the stubble publish the time that prompts my steps. I know what I have to do for my bread before frost locks the land against my hand and fire shoulders the chimney flue. 
Rocks have a word that crows repeat over and over on the cold slopes of winter where the picking is poor. It echoes in empty granaries, and I learn by heart to say in the hard days to come, endure, endure. But now I straddle the field and break its back in the vice of my plow, while a thresh of weather streams by, sweeping up clouds and birds, leaves, banners of smoke. I gouge out furrows, a starved wind ransacks the sky. That's one of my favorite poems, and people um, kind of overlook that poem of Hearst's, I think. You know, it's funny. I'm not used to having such a big audience for poetry. Um, it makes me feel like my writing might actually uh, uh, be read. Uh, <laughs> you know, Hearst was, uh, he, he said the two most important poets of the 20th century were Robert Frost, uh, and some of his farming poems, obviously, um, echo that, but the second one was uh, Yeats. And so uh, Gene Rice was, you know, quoted Yeats earlier. So I have a big act to follow. I have profound things to say, though. Uh, this is uh, called Ice. Uh, I thought it was apropos of the season. All of it will melt someday, or else it won't. And then we'll be locked into a different kind of life. Every penny on the sidewalk frozen heads down. Every gray shift of haze and smoke turns solid and real, suspended like ghosts in the sky. The hands on the face of the clock tower will clench tight. Until at last we stop, mid-stride, look around our unmoving world as the bones inside us creak to silence. And then we'll see, as through a skin of frosted glass, salt crusting and cracking over the slivers of our eyes, a whisper of light, and then we fall asleep behind a bright white stillness. I'll go back to Hearst. I'll read a, a poem that was published in NAR. Um, called Truth. It's one of the more famous poems, and it was called um, A Perfect Example of, I guess, America's Only Indigenous Philosophy, Pragmatism. This is Truth, and some of you know this from hearing Scott Kowalty sing it. Uh, he has a CD out, by the way, you should buy it, of James Hurst's poem set to music. This is one of them. Truth. How the devil do I know if there are rocks in your field? Plow it and find out. If the plow strikes something harder than earth, the point shatters at a sudden blow and the tractor jerks sidewise and dumps you off the seat because the spring hitch isn't set to trip quickly enough and it never is, probably you hit a rock. That means the glacier emptied his pocket in your field as well as mine, but the connection with a thing is the only truth I know, so plow it. Finally, before I read this last poem, I'd like to um, echo Jesse's statements about this magazine, which I'm so proud to be a part of, the oldest magazine in the country, or the literary magazine, 1815. We're going to celebrate our bicentennial sometime really soon, uh, and I hope to have a party at least as big as this. But I'm, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the magazine, uh, and if you're interested, you can make your check out to me, or you can visit the website, or uh, email me, and I'll channel the money to the right place. Uh, this poem is, is a response to Hearst, which is why I saved it. <coughs> one of his more famous poems is called Landscape Iowa, that starts, um, no one who lives here in Iowa, that's what he means, no one who lives here knows how to tell the stranger what it's like, the land he's talking about. Um, so he's saying, you can't describe Iowa. Well, this is my attempt when I moved here three years ago, it's called Relocation. Never mind the pigs, and forget about the corn. Observe the sky turn green with debris, the river restless and rising, as from sleep, where its motion is born. To know a place, know what ancient dangers live there. Harvest every native species of violence and grief, every cruel drought, every untamed coil of wind, and then recall that all this wildness relies on our belief 
Nature is a faith we're afraid to abandon. Imagine the slow black halo of hawks spiraling out from this unlikely center. Imagine somewhere your body rooted in tall grass, the final arrival, another locus of our going, a semblance to home. Thank you. regain my voice when I listen to poetry, it, um, it affects my voice. <laughs> so from poetry to dance, we will easily agree with the great, though physically unhandsome and clumsy, neoclassical English poet Alexander Pope when he writes that true ease in writing comes from art, not chance, as those move easiest who have learned to dance. Teaching and learning movement is a grace of the first order of humanity, as our masterful choreographer and director of the International Dance Theater amply demonstrates. Daniel Wells has cultivated his scholarly knowledge of the arts of movement all over the world, most recently in Bulgaria, Macedonia, and Croatia where Daniel's study yielded the piece being performed today. The piece portrays a range of Thracian village dances condensed into a six minute medley. The rhythms are more elaborate than typical modern and Western rhythms, something we should notice from the beginning. So the piece we're going to present today I call Thracian Sunday and it traditionally is done every week after church people come out and they make their big dinner and the women get together and they cook and they clean and they feed everyone and when they're finished the men go off you know to the local pub because they've been working so hard you know, with eating their dinner, and the women clean up the dishes, and when they're done, they will start to dance. And it brings a community together and helps to teach the people within that community who they are as a community. As the men come back to the, to the town square to start dancing, that's when the real dancing begins, as it was told to me in Bulgaria. The initial dance is traditionally done only by women, and the very final dance in there is traditionally done only by men, but I believe in gender equality, and there's no reason why men cannot dance the women's dance, and women cannot dance the men's dance, so we're going to present with all of us doing the whole bit. So we'll give to you Thracian Sunday.
from movement to motion pictures, finally, we are offered an original film. As Slavoj Žižek says in explaining the cinema's psychosocial economic function in late modernity, cinema is the, per is the ultimate pervert art. It doesn't give you what you desire, it tells you how to desire. Our original filmmaker understands this, and much more, as she shoots a film in which, as she puts it, the narrative remains open-ended, frustrating the desire for closure. In this way, her film shows us how to desire frustration and openness. Francesca Sones, assistant professor of electronic media, will be screening her film in the university room. Those who would like to view the film are invited to depart for the university room now, while everyone else is invited to remain at their topics table. Thank you.